Good afternoon, friends. Welcome to Gorge Poetry Show number 64. We're still at it. No grants, no publicity, just enthusiasm for the written word and the marvelous metaphor. I was just thinking this morning we're at the mercy of metaphors. They uh, run our lives. I don't know if Bruce would agree, but um, this is Bruce Mayer I'm with today, the uh, great poet, anthologist, essayist, professor, organizer of arts, projects. Overworked. Overworked. <laughs> um, almost legendary in uh, his productivity. He tells me this morning he's... Uh, we're up to 65 books? 63 books. 63 books. With eight more finished. Think about that for a minute. <laughs> I've been thinking about it. And um, it's, I think it's an astonishing accomplishment. And certainly the ones I've seen are of very high quality. And um, perhaps we'll uh, convince him to read a little bit from his new and selected. And um, if you hear any background noise, there is a gentleman installing a new countertop in the kitchen. It's not me. <laughs> and it's not Bruce. <laughs> um, so here we are in the backyard in uh, Oakville on a spring morning, enjoying the spring sunshine. And uh, Bruce has already swamped me with, I don't know, five incredible stories already. And um, I'm wondering if you'd like to start with the Northrop Fry story. Well, I was just going to say something about the metaphors. That, yeah. Um, I met Marshall McLuhan once. Yeah. At a party, and he gave me a peanut, and I had this peanut for years. Yeah. Uh, I had a little box in my drawer until my mother threw it out. But, and she said, you don't want that old rancid peanut. You know, so. <laughs> but what was it McLuhan said? Man's got a dream, or what's a metaphor? <laughs> yeah. So, Excellent. Yeah, Excellent. The... Uh, uh, yeah, well, the story about Fry. Fry was Northrop Fry was my professor at Victoria right, College, right. and I studied as an undergrad with both he and Jay McPherson, uh -huh. and they taught a course together called the Mythological Framework in Western Culture. Yes. And Fry taught the Bible, and McPherson taught um, the, the Greek mythology, especially Ovid was her, her specialty. So, um, Fry, I got to know Fry quite well, and I also uh -huh. did a course called uh, as a master's student with him called Literary Symbolism. Yeah. And Fry told me a story about the whole sort of Victoria College connection because yes. um, as a child, when I was three years old, I met E.J. Pratt. My mother had studied with E.J. Pratt. Nice. And I knew Pratt's widow and his daughter, Viola Pratt and Claire Pratt. And Claire mm -hmm. Pratt later became the editor at McClellan and Stewart, who was the person who discovered Leonard Cohen and mm. Al Purdy and Irving mm. Leighton and, mm. and was their mm. sort of, um, sort of or, you know, in-house organizer. Mm -hmm. What happened was the English Department of Victoria College in 1912 had to make a hire. There was a gentleman called Pelham Edgar, who was like the father mm -hmm. of English at the mm -hmm. And the choice of who to hire came down to two candidates. And one was a psychology demonstrator with a background in, um, um, in had a, he had a doctorate in theology and all mm -hmm. things. And he'd done his thesis on William James, and had tried to reconcile William James's theology, and you know the uh, uh, book on William James's uh, matter, matters of. I'm trying to think of the title of it now, but it was mm. the book on religions and religious perception. The variety of religious the variety experiences. Of religious experiences. Right, have a here. copy downstairs. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and he tried to reconcile it with Teilhard de Chardin and Darwin. Yes, good idea. And uh, so they had the psychology demonstrator, who uh -huh. was an ordained minister. And you had a candidate from the University of Pennsylvania who'd lost his job there because he'd been caught with a chorus girl coming out of his uh, flat uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, one morning, and he'd been dismissed from the University of Pennsylvania. So instead of hiring Ezra Pound from the University of Pennsylvania, <laughs> Helen Edgar hired E.J. Pratt. <laughs> and it really changed the whole course of Canadian literature because yes. Pratt became the professor for um, A.J.M. Smith and um, Roy Daniels and Fry, of course. Mm. And the other person that was hired at the same time as Pratt was an individual called E.K. Brown. 
Mm -hmm. And Fry actually followed Brown, and so did uh, A.G.M. Smith. They actually followed Brown to the University of Chicago, where Fry did his mm -hmm. master's thesis. Mm -hmm. And Brown is responsible for the fact that I discovered the trench lit Canada's missing trench literature. Mm -hmm. which, oh, and the, which was a book called um, We Wasn't Pals. We uh, Wasn't, we wasn't pals. pals. There it is there. There um, it is. Margaret Atwood wrote the afterwards for it, and Barry Callahan and I right, edited right. it. Right, um, right. There's some pretty startling stories in that. I read one about a guy reflecting on a, a man getting executed at dawn yeah, that's, for uh, supposed FG, cowardice. F.G. Scott, who was Ooh. the father of F.R. Scott. Ah. So what happened was that, that Brown wrote a book in 1944 uh -huh. called On 1941, I believe it was called On Canadian Poetry. Yes. And On Canadian Poetry, he says that nothing important was written in Canada during the First World War. Ah. And he dismisses all the all the trench literature. Yes. Well, his student was Fry. Yeah. Now Fry, in all of his writings, doesn't touch any of the authors from the First World War. Because when Fry was a little boy, he was yeah. playing the piano for his mother. He was uh -huh. four or five years old. Uh -huh. And the telegram came saying that his older brother, who was like the idol of the family, yes. had been killed at the Battle yes. of Passchendaele. Yes. And Fry's mother went deaf and she never heard him play the piano again. And Fry wow. was a very accomplished pianist. So Fry never mentions went it. Uh, E.K. Brown dismisses it. Uh -huh. So um, around about 1985, 86, just uh -huh. after I'd finished editing David Wevel's selected poems for Exile uh -huh. from uh -huh. Barry Callahan. Uh -huh. Wevel is, again, another Canadian poet who is in Alvarez's new poetry anthology. Right, that's whose and, name I was trying to remember the Wevel, other day. Wevel's poetry, Alvarez. Wevel's interesting because he's still alive, he's in Texas, uh -huh. but he's the whole survivor of that whole Hughes Plath blow up. Yes. And he was, <laughs> he, and, and, and his second wife ran off with, 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 with Hughes and committed suicide. Like yes. Like trying to be like Sylvia Plath. Uh -huh. And Wevel was the only Canadian member of the oh, group. Oh, Asia Wevel. Yeah, Asia Wevel, yeah. Right, stuck her head in the oven. Yeah. Just like, just like the first one, I know. Uh, well, it took anyways, me a few years Dave, to find that David out. David is sort of like my Obi-Wan Kenobi. <laughs> um, he's, he's my Jedi sort of trainer. Yeah, you know. yeah. Um, anyways, um, uh, what I discovered uh, was that... Um, was that uh, there was this huge missing era of, after I had done the Webble book for yeah. Barry Callahan. Yeah. Um, Barry handed me a file and said, you're going back over to England to see your, the man you're doing your thesis on, right. Howard Sargent. Yeah. While you're there, can you take a look for this guy at Oxford? His name's Frank Pruitt. Yeah, yeah. And Frank Pruitt is the only non-English Georgian poet. Like Robert Frost got rejected uh -huh, from uh -huh. the Georgian uh, yeah. anthologies and so forth. Uh -huh. um, Pruitt um, was wounded in the trenches in the First World War while he was recovering at a place called uh, Lennell's, which was one of the three hospitals run by W.H.R. Rivers yes. in the border regions mm. for shell shock. Um, oh, right. yeah, he yeah. meets Siegfried Sassoon, who's back with Rivers for the second time, and Sassoon suddenly takes Pruitt under his wing and makes him a sort of a cause celebre because Pruitt introduces himself as an indigenous Canadian, which he is not. <laughs> That's the but, classic con. But, How many people have done that? Well, he was Grey Wolf. He's another Grey Wolf character. <laughs> yeah. But the interesting thing about Pruitt is that he falls in with Sassoon, but also with Lady Ottilene Morrill, Virginia Woolf. Yes. That's his first book. Yes. And he's at Garsington with Yeats and, and yes. Pound and Elliot for the birth of modernism. Right. Good so, place to be. In the course of finding Pruitt and yes. locating all of his manuscripts and uh -huh. doing the selected poems of Frank Pruitt with Barry Callahan, yes. I discovered that there was about at least 50 other authors, World War I Canadian authors, right. who had been in the trenches. Right. And I remember showing, taking shopping bags around to different publishers, and I was rejected by every publisher in Canada except one. And that was Barry Callahan. Right. And I would hang out with, with Callahan and yeah. Austin Clark and sometimes Antonio DeFonso yeah. on Friday afternoons at a horse race bar on Church Street. It was called Bigliardi's. <laughs> and they had, you know, uh, great wine there and you yeah, know, yeah. good snacks and things like that. And if we were lucky at the ponies, we'd all stay for dinner. You know? Uh huh. So I show these shopping bags to Callahan. He starts opening up and says, So what? And then he opens up one and says, 
Oh my gosh, Ford Maddox Ford wrote the introduction to a book by Peregrine Ackland called All Else is Folly. My father was a close friend of Ford Maddox Ford. Oh, yeah. He says, I've seen that. Who, who, else, who else is in this bag? So I started unpacking all this stuff. And Barry says, who have you told about this missing decade? Yeah. And I said, everybody, but everybody's ignored it. They're saying if it's missing, it should stay missing. <laughs> yeah, Even yeah. the CBC, and, and eventually yes. Michael Enright fought to... To have a good a, old a, Michael, a, Michael and right now who had done all the great books broadcasts, yeah. he fought to yeah. have us on, have me on for Remembrance Day to read in Flanders Field on the CBC to talk about World War One. Yeah, yeah. So, what happened was that I found the dismissals and I found the authors, and we had turned it into We Wasn't Pals, yeah. which became a national best-selling anthology uh -huh. in the Chapters Globe um, sort of um, a chain of bookstores and sure. newspapers and things. In 2000, we reissued another, like an updated edition, an enlarged edition in 2014. Uh -huh. Margaret Atwood saw this, Lou Callahan was working on with me, and she said, yeah. I want to write an afterword for it. Right. So she writes the that. afterword yeah. for it. Uh -huh. And literally, it upset all the apple carts in the same way that Pruitt had upset the apple carts. Uh -huh. uh -huh. the, the critical apple carts. Uh -huh. When we did Pruitt's selected poems, because the assumption in Canadian literary history was uh -huh. that Canadian literature had moved directly from the Victorians right into the McGill group, and yes. that there hadn't been anything in between, yes. except maybe yes. Marjorie Pickthall. Uh -huh. And suddenly you have a trench literature which is just as vibrant as, say, the trench literature of London, Graves, Sassoon, and Owen, and yes. Ivor Gurney, that you have in England. So you would read it up there with, like, Sassoon and those yeah. people? Yeah, and yeah. James Fenton saw... Um, a letter that I found at the University of Texas archives yes. in the boxes of letters to Lady Audley Morrell, but nobody kept her letters. They seem to have thrown all her letters out, but all the letters to her uh -huh. are in the HRC in Texas, in Boston, Texas. Yeah, yeah. And on the back of the letter, Pruitt had written a poem called The Card Game, uh -huh. which goes, Hearing the wine and crash, we hastened out and found a few poor men lying about I put my hand in the breast of the first net. His heart thumped, stopped, and I pulled my hand out wet. The second, he seemed a boy, rolled in the mud, screaming, my legs, my legs, and poured out his blood. We bandaged the rest and went in and returned to our cards where we had been. Ooh, and, very and it's good called person. the card game. And very good. James Fenton, who, uh, yeah. who later became the Oxford professor of poetry, said that that mm -hmm. was probably one of the, the most profound poems of World War One. It's very good. It's very touching. So um, the problem with Canada, and this is this is I will say this, it's a lovely place to live. It's a great place to write. Yes. Um, it varies even better because on a winter night it's quiet. Nobody calls you. Or nobody <laughs> emails you. Everybody forgets that you exist. But what happens in the process is that we lose things. Yeah, yeah. We lost. A decade of Canadian literature. Yes, I'm quoted on a historic plaque um, uh, that used to sat, stand at the corner of Queen and Broadview. Yes, because it was a, a plaque dedicated to the first baseball stadium in Toronto, where the first professional sports championship yes. was won yes. on September 13, 1885. Yeah. yeah, we lost a bloody baseball stadium. Uh huh. We lost our trench riders. Yes, we keep throwing things out along the way. Yeah, yeah. So. You know, they always talk about anthologists and the, the little book the book we were looking at earlier, Canadian Poetry there. Yes. There's an author in there, Audra Alexander Brown. I remember having a discussion with Ralph Gustafson about Audra Alexander Brown. Yes. And I said, so her poems are not bad. And what happened to her? Well, he says, I think I bet on the wrong horses. No, it's the fact that we refuse to have a continuous cultural memory in this country. Uh -huh. And as Bernie says, it's by our lack of ghosts we're haunted. No, it's by our lack of critics we're haunted. There's no critical discussion. And the critical discussion always tends to want to be leading edge. For years it was literature by cocktail party. Yeah. And after a point, things get left out. Yeah. For instance, there was a major Canadian novelist of the 30s and 40s by the name of Gwethelyn Graham. Yeah wrote a book called Earth in High Heaven. Right. I no. almost reviewed it for Books in Canada, but it went out of business before I got to it. Well, that's... But I'll tell you, Anthony Lane, the movie critic for The New Yorker, yeah. gets to write on books once in a while. Yeah. And I, <laughs> I'm looking through his book, 
and he took that Gwethelyn Graham book and trashed it. He trashed it. I'm not kidding you. Now, because he's a movie critic, hardly anybody noticed. Yeah. And this is a recent book. This is not, you know, yeah. something many years ago. I'm not saying it's one way or the other. I'm just letting you know that he had a real go at it as a really second-rate novel and how come it was so successful. Well, you know? at one point, there was a woman or in the early years of the 20th century uh -huh. who was the largest selling novelist in the English language. Yes. And her name was Isabella Ecclestone Mackay. Okay, I'll accept that. I didn't know and it. And <laughs> completely off the radar was yeah. she was a Canadian author. It's another author, Grace Irwin. Yes. Least of All Saints. Yes. Uh, again, it's considered one of the hottest novels in the English language in the early, uh, mid-1940s. Uh -huh. mid yeah. Right off the radar. I knew Grace yeah. Irwin, too. And, I mean... The, because it's popular rather than literary? Is that what you're saying? No, it, I think... This is the point Brown makes, and this is uh -huh. this is the Brown thesis gone awry. Uh -huh. That anything that is popular is should be set aside. It shouldn't be given any critical right, attention. Right, right, right. That principle is still active in Canadian criticism. Yeah, yeah. So that you know, um, right now we hail things that are almost unreadable. I won't mention any names, but we hail things mm -hmm. that are almost unreadable. Mm -hmm. Why? Because um, they're obscure, and obscurantism seems to be. Yes. What causes the critics to teach the stuff and to put it on courses. Yes, yes. There are poets, and I will name them, who are wonderful poets, uh -huh. like Marty Gervais, John Lee, John B. Lee, uh -huh. Lawrence Hutchman, Bruce Hunter, um, um, uh, Micheline Naylor, uh -huh. um, who are really tremendously fine, uh, and Marianne Mulhern, they're tremendously fine poets. Uh -huh. But people aren't paying attention to them. Why? Because they're readable. Now, yes. My experience in the U.S. with the American informalists uh -huh, uh -huh. says no poetry should be a public phenomenon. Right. It should be accessible to people. Uh -huh. And American poetry, the poetry that seems to be shared the most, uh -huh. you know, the, the, uh, and this is Dana Joya's point in his book uh -huh. *Can Poetry Matter*. Uh -huh. The point that Joya makes is quite apt: that Americans love accessible poetry. They and do. That the whole yes. point behind the new formalist. Billy was, Collins is very accessible. Oh, yeah, totally. I, well, I love Billy Collins. Uh huh. You know, um, and. Mary Oliver? Mary Oliver, uh, uh -huh. uh, Linda Paston, uh, Jane Ron Kenyon. Ron Padgett? <laughs> I haven't read Ron Padgett, no. But well, I, he's quite a character, yeah. let me tell you. As accessible as all get out. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I do I do love Collins and I love uh, I love uh, uh, you know Oliver yes yes and I'm going well why should I dislike them because they're accessible right um, but we have accessible poets in Canada but we're, we're uh -huh. and it's it's interesting that you know I mean Marty Gervais published my book 1967 Centennial Year yes. through the publishing practicum at the University of Windsor uh huh. And he also did a book on the Rum Runners. Mm -hmm. And when they sold those books, mm -hmm. the lineup at the Kaboto Club, it was a big, huge, sort of, uh, yeah, yeah. almost like it was like a, a conference hall. Yeah. The lineup went around twice. Yeah. <laughs> we sold 750 copies of 1967 in one night. Yikes. Uh, because Marty, of the title, you think? It, I don't know, oh, yeah. it, but people showed up and they bought it and they said, we can, this or is... Or were you already a well-established poet at the oh, time? Oh, I was, well, I, I hope I'm well-established, yeah. but I mean, I didn't think uh -huh. I was that well-established. Yeah, that's a lot in one neighbor. that's astonishing. And the lineup went around the hall twice, uh -huh. and people were buying 20 copies. Oh, uh, and okay. I was invited to the Kingsville Folk Festival to read there. The Kingsville Folk Festival? And the only Festival. thing I said is they said, do you play any instruments? And I said, just, just the typewriter. <laughs> 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 I thought I should bring along my portable underwood and yeah, clock away yeah. on it. Um, <laughs> How did that go over with the folk audience? It was interesting. I mean, they were receptive. Uh huh. And I think they were receptive because the poems were meant to be, um, they meant to be public poems. Yes, yeah, I get you. And yeah. I found that when I was poet laureate of Barry for four years, right, that slipping into public poetry was not a huge leap from from writing private poetry because yes. I wanted the private poetry to be accessible. Uh huh. Uh huh. Like there's a poem in there about my father and I line, that was written an hour before the book went to press. Yikes! What's that one called? Uh, it's Let's called "Wrapping a Silence Around My Heart," and it's toward the end of the book, and it's about um, Marty phoned me up and he says, uh, "I need one more poem for the book." And I yeah. said, oh, "Okay." 
I said, do you want me to go through the pile of the stuff we cut? And he says, no, I need a new poem. I just found out that um, the first non-Tim Hortons in Hamilton opened in Toronto in November of 1967. Uh -huh. And I said, I was there. I wanted to go and meet Tim Horton, and my father and I lined up for a couple of hours in the cold. Uh -huh. And we stood there together. Yeah. And when we got there, they locked the door, and they said, sorry, we're out of coffee. We're, oh, we're, we're running out of everything. Everything. Yeah. So, but it's about fathers and sons. Well, it's right here. Would it's you right like here. to read it? Sure, okay. This is a poem titled, from 1967, Centennial Year, titled, Wrapping a Silence Around My Heart. My father and I never said much. He skated figures, I hockey. It broke his heart when I couldn't find the edges of my bower blades. We shared the ice, the dreams, but it was always different, me and him. We shared a sidewalk one Saturday, the day the first Toronto Tim Hortons opened on Northern Avenue Road. I wanted to meet Tim Horton, had heard him uh, teach how to block a shot on an LP that featured Johnny Bauer. The line for the shop crested over the hill and disappeared down a side street. I stood and watched a road hockey game, wishing I could leave him and join in. But we stood together. We were meant to. Fathers and sons have a silent bond. What cannot be said in easy words finds other expressions, other ways. By the time we got to the shop's door, they'd run out of coffee. Every bun had gone into someone else's life. <laughs> I wanted to know the taste of Java, the bitterness that sits on the tongue and flows melodically to warm the heart. Years later, as my father was dying, I'd bring him a cup of his contraband joy. He'd smile as the steam clouds danced on his lips, his favorite treat, a chocolate dip left telltale signs around his mouth. He'd lick his lips. A coffee and donut tell a story. A donut is silence wrapped in bread. The way it is coated defines a language spoken by fathers to their only sons, wrapping a silence around a heart to hold in everything we needed to say. No, oh, very good, excellent. So, I mean, as I say, the poets I feel most akin to. Yes are poets like Gervais mm. and Lee and, and mm -hmm. Lawrence Hutchman and Bruce Hunter. Why? Because they, and I think we recognize this in, in our work, mm. is that we write to be accessible. Uh -huh. um, the, it, it, Lee's poetry is profoundly philosophical, but in a kind of way that sneaks up on you. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's um, like he'll write about having Sunday dinner. He'll write about wearing his dead uncle's you know, sports coats. Mm, uh, mm. He's got a book called Dressed in Dead Uncles, for example. <laughs> Gervais has a t is a natural storyteller. Uh -huh. uh, he's got a poem about the seventh son of the seventh son, for example. And I think, you know, that kind of poetry, um, it's a public poetry. It addresses, it addresses an audience, and the audiences like it. But, well, they do, yes. But there's a, a gap somewhere. And uh -huh what gets forgotten in the process uh -huh. is the fact that poetry is a public utterance, not just, in fact, an academic exercise. And that's coming from an academic. Well, I see a, a, an analogy here to uh, post-war, World War II, classical music, which went very experimental, avant-garde, 12-tone, well, 12-tone was earlier, but I remember the 60s and 70s was filled with classical music that you uh, uh, struggled to understand and even struggled harder even to enjoy and then m lyricism came in slowly but surely Andrew Lloyd Parrott. Webber's Requiem uh -huh, I haven't heard that oh, that, oh you should hear it. Andrew Lloyd Webber's Requiem it's like yeah. amazing yeah. Uh, Michael but, Conway Baker was a Canadian composer right, right, uh, right. Wash, his, his ballad yeah. suite Washington Square is amazing yeah. an indigenous composer yeah. no one's pointed this out you know, that, that well, I think I've heard it on CBC yeah, yeah. yeah it, but it, it's, yeah. it's a brilliant but you brilliant know this movement away from hyper intellectualism yeah. um, I see it in all levels of culture um, even uh, post-war uh, European film moving into uh, taking over the American studio system and uh, with the Americans that were influenced by it and then making movies that were about real people doing real things. Um, well I think there was a kind of breakthrough. I, I remember coming out of seeing Field of Dreams 
Ah, oh, yes. And and phoning my father, crying on the phone. So, I love you, Dad. <laughs> um, you know, and he says, oh, "Yeah, my, what's?" He says, "He says you need money." And like, no. I just <laughs> um, but uh, uh, you know, I, I there's there were movies that were suddenly breakthrough movies. You yes, know? yes. And I think I you know. I, I think that, that, that there has to be a happy medium somewhere that, yes, uh -huh. you can throw in the intellectual elements. It was magic realism in, in Field of Dreams. You right, know. right. But, uh, you know, and, I, you know, I, I knew Kinsella. I wrote a book of baseball stories. He didn't yes. like them because I, des I described baseball play in the stories. <laughs> but at the same time, I, I think that there's a need to, uh, to make, to tell something that is human. Uh -huh. I think that, that's what resides uh -huh. at the core of literature. Is to tell a human story. Uh huh. Uh huh. Um, so let me throw a curveball into this discussion. Um, how do we account for the preeminence and achievement of someone like John Ashbery in this situation, whose work is brilliant, but it's extremely hard to understand? When I'm reading it on poetry show, I say to people, "Okay, forget about understanding it." just experience the music of the language. Well, I think that's what people crave too. And yeah. I, 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 what happens is when I read sometimes, uh -huh. my, I'm left handed so I'm holding the book in my left hand, yeah. <laughs> but my right hand suddenly goes off on its own and yeah. I end up conducting. Dana Joya does the same thing. Uh -huh. He doesn't even uh -huh. realize he's doing it. Uh -huh. um, and Joya's work is incredibly accessible. But yes. he's been influenced by film noir, he's been yes. influenced by the events in his own life, yes. he's been influenced by classical literature. Yes. So there's a, a, a profound sense of the literary in Joy's yes. work. But at the same time, there's also this, this sense of telling a story. Yeah. And I think yeah, at the root of consciousness, mm. and this has to do with the way our minds work, yeah. we want to be told stories. Well, you know, that's it, a traditional it, thing, it, sitting around the fire, yeah. listening to the storyteller of the tribe. And we, yeah. we want to, see, consciousness is narrative. And uh -huh. it's one thing after another. And uh -huh. the whole idea of wanting an afterlife is yes. the idea that we don't want our story to end. Right. Well, you know, exactly. It's like Believe Star Wars. Me, I understand that one, Bruce. Yeah. I wrote an essay called uh, Incarnation is the Ultimate Narrative. Yeah, sure. And it is. Yeah. The story of our lives, when we look at the life from the afterlife, we look back and we examine our lives. It's the ultimate narrative. Yeah. It's like Ulysses or something. Yeah. And, and the other thing, I mean, the lovely thing about Ulysses, and uh, having taught the Odyssey and written about yeah. the Odyssey and the Golden Thread, yeah. and talked about Ulysses in, in Heroes and so forth, uh -huh. is that... Um, oh, yes. Excellent it, book, by the way. Oh, book 11 of the Odyssey t says, points us to the fact that there's... Oh, heroes. heroes. Excellent that, study. Uh, that, that, that there's further adventures to, to Ulysses' life. Yeah. Tennyson, Tennyson picks up on this in his poem, yes. Ulysses. Yes. You know, that Odysseus is going to, isn't going to sit and rot in Ithaca. Uh -huh. He's going to you know, press on you know, and smite the sounding furrows with our oars for purpose uh -huh, was uh -huh. to sail beyond the baths of all the western stars until I die. And it's this whole idea uh -huh. that we're born to strive to seek to find and not to yield. Uh -huh. Now, the weird thing about heroes... I like that quote. Yeah, I, I love that quote. <laughs> well, I, 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 talking about that quote, um, I was giving a, 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 lec a kind of like a class on the classics for Frontier College. I used to go into yes. Seton House in Toronto, yes. which is the sort of the filing cabinet where Toronto puts its unwanted men. Yes, I understand. And yes. um, I was sitting around a table with about 20 guys. Yeah. And all ages, you know, all backgrounds, and all states of, you know, uh, I suppose, you know, physical, you know. Distress. Distress <laughs> and so forth. And um, as I got to the last line, they all started reciting Tennyson's Ulysses with me, all 20 of them. No, they learned it in school. They, they had learned it in school, and uh -huh. they said that's what's keeping this going. Uh, and the interesting thing about heroes, um, at, least, yes. at least for me, as I was confronted by this huge amount of hero theory, you had Thomas Carlyle picking his favorite people from history. Yes, yes. You have Otto Rank, for example. You have Joseph Campbell's hero pattern, which is a very complex an anthropological sort of you know dial almost, you know, uh -huh, uh -huh. showing the conscious world and the unconscious world. And I started thinking, Fry's, you know 
discussion of the heroes in, in anatomy of criticism, yes. high mimetic, yes. low mimetic, all these different definitions. And as I was writing heroes, it struck me that it's much simpler than that. That there is, in fact, at the root of West, at the core of Western consciousness, uh -huh. not only narrative, but there is, in fact, a tripartite structure. Yes. Which is constantly replayed in television programs. Mm. And yes. Everywhere yes. you look, and it's the hero who has to solve a puzzle. Yes. In order to solve the puzzle, he has to kill the monster. Yes. Or trap the monster. Yes, and I what get is it. that? It's the story of the golden thread from the story of Theseus and the Labyrinth, yeah. which was the you know the, the golden thread was the title for my, my first book from Harper Collins. Mm. Heroes was the second book, mm. but every everything from sitcoms to yes, uh, this, uh, you know uh, Law and Order episodes, NCIS, and they're mm -hmm. all following the same pattern. Killing the monster. Yeah. Sometimes the monsters are intelligence agencies. Sometimes they're mafia guys. Or sometimes they're bankers. As Rilke points out, they are simply those things that need our love. Oh, good as, point. As Rilke points good out point. in letters I to like a young that. poet. Yes. And well done. you know that that we're 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 haunted by what we have not yet come to understand. Absolutely. And I often think that poetry is the poetry I'm writing now. Uh -huh. is the way I have I am struggling to come to that understanding of what I need to understand. Yes, yes. You see, we only, I mean, there's the old saying, you only know what you know. Uh-huh, And uh -huh. you don't know what you don't know. Uh -huh. But poetry is the means by which we pursue what we don't know through what uh -huh. we know. Uh-huh, uh-huh, I understand. I mean, it sounds, I remember, it sounds uh, slightly mystical, but, uh, you know. When I was chatting a lot with, uh, with David McFadden, who's passed on now, um, he, he, we t discussing this matter, and he said, uh, quoting his friend George Burning, he says, when George wants to understand something, he writes a book about it. Mm. And I thought, oh, thanks, David. I'll, I'll remember that quote. Yeah. I, I, have to, I have to throw it to George some point, see if he agrees, but uh, it's a very good point. I like it a lot. Yeah, and the other thing, the other point that I make at the end of The Golden Thread uh -huh. is the question of what purpose does literature serve? Yes. And is it more than storytelling? It's more than storytelling. We're uh -huh. writing ourselves into existence. Oh, okay. Yep. And it's yep. it's an important point. The, the 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 idea is that we we we're not sure that we we're not. There's an uncertainty principle at work in the universe. Mm. And art, um, as Freud says in Civilization's Discontent, mm. answers that uncertainty principle. Mm -hmm. And that by writing, we are in fact telling our own stories so we have a record, a subjective or an objective record mm -hmm. out there, mm -hmm. yeah, somewhere in part of the superego, yeah. that in fact allows us to see that we exist and confirms our existence. Uh -huh. it's, it's, like the, uh, it's an interesting idea because the, the characters in Beckett, I, I did a course at McMaster with Anthony, um, uh, Tony uh, Brennan years ago, yeah, yeah. who was a big Beckett fan. and. The characters in Beckett only exist as long as they speak. Yes, yes. And they're constantly, like Winnie in Happy Days, for example. Yes. You know, and Willie gets up and leaves. Don't leave me. That, that'll be the end of it. Uh -huh. And he gets up and leaves, and that's the end of it. Yeah, yeah. So I think that literature is, is our search, our pursuit yes. of whether or not we exist or not, and the affirmation of our existence. And once we know that we are going to affirm to ourselves that we we're here mm -hmm. and we're mm -hmm. taking in the world but we're part of the world we don't want it to end we want mm -hmm. the narrative to continue mm -hmm. we do yes. and also along the way we like to think that we're improving ourselves and that sounds buddhist <laughs> mm -hmm. but there is this sense of we're of, maturing ourselves well, like we're, wine where we're learning Mm -hmm. We're learning, you know, and we're we're learning so, as as a reincarnationist. Yeah. I would say that's exactly what reincarnation is yeah. about: learning and getting better. And I happen to think that 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 is a certain point, and this is something Hawking would suggest as well. Yeah. Literature, science, and religion are all going to converge. Okay, be interesting to watch it happen. Yeah, because uh -huh. I I think that's the direction things are pointing. Uh huh. Uh huh. Well. It's certainly uh, not uncommon these days to see all sorts of esoteric science stuff quoted in novels or re referenced, you know, quantum physics being the best example. Well, as my friend Robert, Sw yeah. uh, Robert Sawyer says, 
he said, he's a friend of my right. wife, Mars, he says, you know, if you're going to write science fiction, you got to get the science right first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, when you mentioned Samuel Beckett, I'm just checking our time here. Oh, good, we got lots of time. Um, did you ever see the, the doc on Peggy Guggenheim? No. Uh, yes, Angel? I saw a bit of it, yes. I saw it at TIFF almost by accident a couple of years ago. A great doc. But you got this image of Samuel Beckett. You know, the gaunt, half, you know, short hair, not shaved often, you know, and sort of serious. And, and then in this thing, it comes out, he had an affair with Peggy. Well, Peggy was, you know, a fond of her boyfriends. And nothing against her for that. I'm all for people liking each other. Um, but there's a reference in there about what a great lover he was. And they spent an entire weekend in a hotel and never came out. <laughs> so, I mean, to me, that was just astonishingly funny because you've got this thing. Everyone looks at Beckett as, oh, oh, it's terribly serious. And is there a God? And is there a meaning to anything? And why do we do anything? Yeah. And then suddenly he's this sensualist. He's this guy that loves life and spends an entire weekend in bed with Peggy Guggenheim yeah, but, in a hotel. But, but Beckett, you have to understand, this is what the thing that everybody misses yeah. about Beckett is that Beckett is writing about clowns. Okay. His, his, his highly you mean clown in the traditional sense? He's highly influenced by Commedia dell'arte. Okay. And okay. there's a sense of masks. There's uh -huh. a sense of play. Uh-huh. Um, uh -huh. You know, Vladimir and Estragon are clowns. Sometimes I've seen it argued that way, sure. Yeah, and, yeah. And they are clowns. You know, they're, they're clowns. They're tramps. Yeah. Vagabonds, in the same way that Weary Willie, the famous clown of the 1950s, Weary Willie. Uh -huh. I think so, uh, yeah. Emmett Kelly was the guy's name. Played. Okay. He was Weary Willie. Uh -huh. I can remember I had a jack in the box as a child with <laughs> Weary Willie on the front and became fascinated by, by Emmett Kelly. Uh, uh, Marcel Marceau is yes. the same thing, like trapped in the imaginary box. Yes, like The yes. mimes and everything. That, that whole sense of clowning uh -huh. is a way in which and uh, um, an actor is creating a separate reality mm. um, around themselves, you know, and in front of an audience, uh -huh, a uh -huh. separate reality where they can explore things that don't, they can explore and test the limits of this reality, but they can explore a reality that has an entirely different set of yes. limits and understandings yes. and physics to it. Yes. And that's what Beckett's doing, and it comes right, even right down to those jokes about shoes. I mean, if uh -huh. you, um, I did a paper once on shoes and Samuel Beckett, uh -huh. and it, he can't shut up about shoes. Now, if you go to <laughs> Ireland, and I, I remember going over there with my friend Brian O'Riordan, who I yeah. did two interview books with. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. The first thing people look at in Ireland are your shoes. Really? I went over. I this was in the. I was living in London, in 1983, and yeah, Brian yeah. came over. Yeah, yeah. And around Christmas, we said he said, "Let's go over a flower to Dublin. And yeah. Hang out with all my extended family over there." Yes, we yes. had a great time. We, um, we took the well, long. Gregory way. Bax is telling me the same thing about Dublin right now. Well, what a great time he's having. We, we were trying to get in the middle of a horribly blinding, sleeting gale. Yeah, yeah. We were trying to get to Joyce's Tower, and we yeah. saw it on the other side of this wall, so we left over, or Brian left over uh -huh. the wall, and I hear a password from the other side, I look over, and a wave washes over Brian, he'd leapt into the Irish Sea, <laughs> and we, I leapt down after him to try to rescue him, yeah. and we scaled Joyce's Tower, not from the walkway, yet. Uh -huh. there's a door, uh -huh. uh -huh. we scaled it from the seaside, Yeah. and there was a Quaker gentleman who ran the tower along with the, the cleaning lady, and they stood there watching us through the door. And we got there and they said, well, you might have been taking the easy way in. You know. Well, as everywhere we went in Dublin, yeah. I was wearing Kodiak boots. Yeah, in yeah. the early 80s, they were the big thing. And I, uh -huh. I found them extremely comfortable. I wore them as an undergraduate uh -huh. and graduate uh -huh. student and everything. And people would look at me and they'd immediately go down to the Kodiak boots. And they'd say, uh -huh. do you take ditches for a living? <laughs> and I said, no, what would make you think, ah, oh, you got your work boots on, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I found it hard to get waited on in shops because there were two things that I didn't have on. One was a tie and the other one was proper shoes. Oh, jeez, really? And it, it's an interest. I, I remember talking to my mother about this and I had a great, great grandfather who uh -huh. was a shoemaker and then a skillet. Yes. And um, he, he would make shoes, yes. uh, like, you know, special, specialty shoes. For very wealthy people. So yes, forth. yes. And um, there, there's an old family joke that apparently he, an uncle delivered the, the pair of shoes to this Mrs. Spence. And she <laughs> says, 
and she says to my my uncle's uncle James, great great uncle. Uh-huh. She says, "I've never known your father to make a good pair of shoes." <laughs> and he says to Mrs. Spence, "Well, Mrs. Spence, I've never." He says, "My father can make a good pair of shoes, but he can't make a good pair of feet." <laughs> Great. <laughs> and, well, Bruce, yeah. it's so funny you should tell that story because my dermatologist, who's from Hong Kong, but has lived in Canada for decades, spontaneously told me one day he, he, was, he didn't like living in Hong Kong because he said it was the kind of place that people would not look you in the eye, but they would look at your shoes and yeah. judge you by the type of shoes you were wearing. Yeah. And I, I've always regarded that as a sort of a, a little story in its own category off in a corner, mm -hmm. and here you are complimenting it. Well, you see, here, here's, the interesting, here's the interesting thing. This is what Joseph Campbell might point out about shoes. If he was uh -huh. okay. I met Campbell. Nice. Um, he would say well, what shoes are, are, they are the armor of the soul. Ooh. Not just the sole of the foot, but the uh -huh, sole. And uh -huh. the, the bottom of the foot in you know, Hindu uh -huh, traditions soul, and Eastern yeah. traditions is through the sole of the foot. Yes. So that what the, what you put on your feet is an indicator of the way you regard your soul. Ooh. And you'll find that a lot, of, a lot of cultures that are mystically based, whether yes. they are in the East, and you know, Hindu tradition and Buddhist yes. tradition, or in Ireland, which is still... And I remember uh, Anne Dooley, the Celtic scholar at St. Michael's yes. College, saying, yes. you know, that that the that Ireland's you know traditional spiritual values are closer to Hinduism than they are to oh, anything else. Really, and you can see this. The Celts the came from India. Well, there's a mythology of the New Age. Well, it's an interesting idea, but the, th <laughs> the thing is that they're they're both in many ways non-materialistic. That yes, um, that they, they they they're both hero-oriented. Narratives yes. and the narratives yes. that they tell are hero oriented and so forth. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, and uh, but it, it strikes me that that when you get back to the idea of footwear, where you're going to be measured by footwear are in cultures that consider you are presenting your souls to people. And this is why, for instance, in a lot of cultures, this is the greatest sign of respect when you enter someone's house is to take off your, your shoes. Your shoes. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. I, I do that a lot. Um, I'm wondering, first of all, we've got about three minutes, according to the memory of this computer. Could you retell the Northrop Fry story you told me, the one from 1941, the beginning of the war? Oh, yeah, I'll, very quickly. Yeah, um, it's a great story. At the beginning of December of 1941, um, it, uh, Northrop Fry said it looked as if the Allies were going to lose the war. Yes, uh, Pearl yes. Harbor had been bombed. Right. Hong Kong had fallen. Yes, and um, everything was bad, and they uh, he went one night to Earl Burney's apartment on Hazelton Avenue in Toronto. Yes, and um, A. G. M. Smith was there, Roy Daniels, uh, Barker Fairley, who ran the Canadian Forum, yes. Fry, yes, E. J. Pratt, and yes. Burney were there. Yes, and Pratt read the truant, and Burney read Vancouver Lights, and Fry said he came out of that evening thinking. We're going to win this war, but he, they, they were. As he went in, he went in thinking they're going to have to shut down the university next week because they can't afford the electricity. Yes, yes. All the men are going off the boat. The students are going off yes, to war. The women yes. are involved in war work. He says we're going to lose this war, and he came up thinking, no, we're going to win this war. Wow, great story. And you heard that right from that his from, lips. That from Fry, and wow. of course the line in Earl Burney's poem at the end of Vancouver Lights is the line, "There was light." Yes. And <laughs> I was watching the great light over Vancouver. Yes, yes. Well, thanks for that. I'm glad we managed to squeeze that in. Um, so, let me see. Yeah, we're doing the last couple of minutes here. Um, you will consent to doing a part two sometime? Oh, I'd love to. Anytime. Yes! Anytime you want. He said There's, yes! And come to Barry, you can see my library of 24,000 books. Excellent, my, my excellent. My as I call it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people that, that uh, you know, Colin Wilson, the English author, mm -hmm. he's reputed to have 30,000 books in his garage. Mm -hmm. And, of course, everyone wants to go and have a look at it. <laughs> and we don't know if his wife has kept it or not. But it's like, my God, what kind of... What kind of library does he have? Well, there's there's, there's um, two spines. Yeah. But I've got three death masks. Ooh. In the library, one yeah. is uh, the death mask of John Keats. Ooh, nice. Another one is the death mask of William Blake. Yes. And the other one is Dante's death mask. Hmm. And you can actually see 
You can actually hold Dante's face in your hand. Wow. Yeah. In the middle of life, I find myself in a dark wood. Yeah. But there is light. Yeah, <laughs> Um, well, thank you very much, Bruce. It's been thank a you. great interview. I've had well, a thank blast. Thank you, Bruce. It's been, been fun. Yes. Yeah. Nice Good to for be you here. too. Nice to be thank, here. You. thank you. Thank you. So, uh, friends, we're at the end of our uh, tether here. <laughs> the computer's saying enough, enough, enough. So, um, as you can gather, more will be coming very soon. And I thank once again Bruce Mayer from coming all the way from Barry to Oakville on this really nice spring day actually and um thank you all for watching and we'll uh rattle on at you again soon